Okay, uh, thank you again, Nimesh. And you know, I I came with a different presentation, and in the morning when I was listening to all of you, I thought, what am I going to do now? And actually, try and what is you know, what is sustainability? So it, all good ideas actually started. But people says not you know this guy is crazy. So these are some of the international examples, and you see where all these industries are today. Okay, Beatles, IBM, oil. Uh, you know, it, no one, I mean, the question we were asked is, is skill development sustainable, right? I can actually just sit down now and say, Jitendra has done it for me, so, you know, that's the proof of the pudding, right? But I thought I'll just actually spend and just talk about some of the challenges going forward. And really, first question is, are entrepreneurs looking at sustainability? Okay, or are, are NGOs looking at sustainability? In the morning, there was one version that, you know, we have, government has to do something. You've actually seen a live example where the government model has been actually turned into a sustainable model, right? Is funding the only answer? I think you've also got a question there, but I'll give a perspective. And what's the enabling organization structure to make that happen? So what we actually did in NSDC, this is a busy slide, but just look at the three boxes there. There are completely unviable segments. There are viable, marginal, or high-risk high segments, and there are attractive segments. So IT is typically an attractive uh, segment. But each of these boxes becomes blue if you uh, achieve 1x, which is the magic figure. A company is willing to pay you one month's salary as a placement fee. A student is willing to pay his first month's salary as a cost of training. That's the magic. I mean, that's, that's the learning. And how you do it is the entrepreneurial challenge that you have. There's no one way to do it. There are multiple ways to do it. So everybody says that the blue segment, which is the upper you know, high wage, short payback period. So real innovation and real sustainability is how do you move these at the bottom, which are long payback, which are below the poverty line, to that. So you know, that's, that's really the challenge of sustainability. And that's what entrepreneurs are all about, right? You either get scale to reduce the cost, you get innovations to reduce the cost. You find different ways of risk sharing and cost sharing, so you actually move things. We have examined 42 projects, life projects. And we have found that each of the 42 projects have some elements where they have actually moved from here to there. It is possible. You've actually seen bottom of the pyramid, BPL, actually happening there. The other thing is, what's the role of NSDC? I think if I can convince Dr. Eddy's foundation that we are actually social capital, right, then people will understand what NSDC is all about. So NSDC is only enabling, right? So we give two to three year payback periods, I mean monitoring periods, so that you can, you know, you require six to eight months to test your models require one to one and a half, two years to start getting the capital. And there was a big debate. Why is NSDC putting a 6% interest rate? The 6% interest rate is that that will force you to become sustainable. Because if you get money, and if, just to take Dr. Reddy's example, if Dr. Reddy were to come to NSDC and say, look, you know, I'm thinking of moving from an unsustainable model to sustainable. I'm limiting myself to 100 sectors. I have another 50 sectors, centers which I want to make sustainable. Could you do th something special for, for me? The answer would be yes. If the 50 centers ex need some viability gap funding, which money is not going to come back to NSDC, you need to actually do that, we will consider it. So there's no one funding model. And you know, it is very interesting. So we looked at viable segments. There's certain, there are for profit play, self sustaining play. Non-profit, of course, uh, is, is a question about we didn't know. So there's equity which we invest in, there's a soft loan which you give to all the sectors, and there's a grant. So the grant model is there in a non-profit play, but as long as it's been made into a sustainable model. So the idea here is that the funding has to be structured to make models sustainable. If you take our construction example, we've given it at them to a 0% loan because that's the most difficult sector to make sustainable. 
And they are now, I mean, people from all over the country are going to this project called by, by Creda in Pune to see how they're making construction sustainable. But they're actually making it sustainable because they got it down to 1x. And the guy, after training his salary, the next day goes up from 150 rupees on the construction side to 450 rupees. So they're upskilling people, but then he says, hey, why don't you come and join as a helper? You know, after one month, you can actually get trained and come up to this level. So aspiration quotient has been built by demonstrating what's happening. Is entrepreneurship working? We have at least 42 people who believe that entrepreneurship is working. Many of you in this room, uh, some of you had a long and hard cry last night saying that, uh, which I think Hari Menon in the morning talked much more eloquently than I can say. It's tough. It's not, you know, it takes guts. I like to, you know, really compliment Jitendra for his move from making it grant based to a sustainable model. Uh, it's, you know, given the amount of work that they have done to push the grant based model, it's like literally eating your words and saying that this is not going to work, we need to look at a new model. So you've got to, you know, entrepreneurship is all about making it work. And you'll see that there's a very strong resonance in what he presented and what I'm presenting. And although we did not share uh, uh, the presentations earlier. Is it working? It's working. But if these organizations whose target was to do 500,000 people this year, they've done, they'll do 162,000. Is it a problem? No, it's not a problem. Because while we told the world what they wanted to do, internally NSDC's target is 162,000, right? So the lesson we've learned is don't change an entrepreneur's or a social enterprise's model. Let them go with their model. You then internally factor in what needs to be done and put that little bit of pressure to make them achieve. In this room, there are people who have not met targets. We have stretched their uh, painfully stretch their disbursement by two to three months. There are some people who got disbursement one month earlier. You know, so you risk and reward the social entrepreneur to go in. Interestingly, placement rates are very high, 80%. And it's both in the organized and the unorganized sector. It's actually happening in the unorganized sector. People are, you know, wanting in the local Kirana store in the local construction project, the rate of return for the very poor, for local jobs or local skills is 100%. It's when you want to do the migratory model, then you have challenges. And for all of you, you know, I was listening with very a lot of interest about the thing about migration, urban migration. It's a fallacy. The numbers are false because the government has redefined the definition of urban, urban centers. So you actually have more centers and therefore more people seemingly urban. But if you look at the census data, the migration to Mumbai has declined. 2001 and 2011. Ditto Delhi, Ditto Bangalore. And there's a lot of rural urban tra uh, travel and a lot of rural rural migration happening. So, you know, we got to look. So 100 centers, dispersed centers is totally uh, what it is, 244 districts. You know, people criticize NSDC that NSDC should have done 500,000, but not done that. Come on, 244 districts people are present in 18 months. It's not possible. And by next year, if these guys do 500,000, then you know people will say, no, but they were supposed to do a million. But we'll get to 150 million. And we are writing off the first year, three years numbers, by the way, I'll tell you why we're doing that. So there was this fantastic thing, you know, how do you make it sustainable? You have to give industry a role to play and own the process. Today, they don't own the education process. They say we can't employ the guys whom we're producing, so we're going to do our own training. We're going to go to different organizations. How do you get industry to assess and certify the people that you train? This is through the sector skill councils. That's the point which he made sitting at the back at that point of time. We've got 10 already approved. They will do the occupation standards. They will do the assessment and certification. Now the government system is revolting to this. They're saying, my God, it was in our hands. How can we give it else to somewhere? 
But I mean, I'm sitting in an organization which is, or we all are sitting in the organization which has revolted against the system. This is not accredited to ASETE, and that's a problem. So I think we need to get industry to certify. Wherever the industry linkage is, wherever they certify, those ones are succeeding much, much more than the other ones. Now, is funding the only answer? I think you heard it before. You gotta connect all the stakeholders. Connect industry. Connect the NGOs. Connect the training organizations. Connect training organizations together without being present, like dinner yesterday. So, you know, you can share examples. Get them all around the table, because the learning from each other is much more valuable than any intervention. How do you evangelize with industry? A lot of criticism, NSDC is in the media. Once you get this thing, you will be shot down because people, but we can't do it. We have to tell industry that, hey guys, you need to wake up. You need to support. What's the best way to then go into their own conference where they are sitting and then convey this message? That's what we do. And social entrepreneurs are typically very used to writing things for grants. They're very difficult to write proposals. So we don't, ac we don't accept to reject a proposal. We work with the proposal owner to actually build the proposal. We say, do a pilot, come back to us, patient, doesn't matter. We give a lot of lead time. Hopefully this afternoon we close a proposal which has taken one and a half years to convince that person to put in a proposal. So, you know, that's it. Hopefully, we'll be able to partner Dr. Reddy's foundation. Don't know, still waiting for that day, <laughs> but we'll be able to do it. Three in 2009. 52 till date, hopefully another six to eight in the next board meeting on 29th. 44 next year. No? We want to create 500 social entrepreneurs. I'll come to that in a minute. Every business takes time. So we're not looking, seeking return on capital. We're letting you take the capital. We are looking at improving returns by giving viability cap funding. We give you 75%. So if uh, Jitendra wants to take his 100 centers to 400 centers, with the amount of capital he has, he can leverage more money from us and scale up. I think 100,000 for him is, for 150 centers, a very conservative number. If he's already achieved the numbers that he has got. We also don't give all the money up front. We give it to you in transparency. We commit the funding. So when you see our figures, we say, we have committed 1,147 crores, or now it's 1,200 and some crores. But dispersal is only 175 crores, because that's what it is there. We don't commit much more than that is in the, in the NSDF. We fund all types of projects. But we say that the answer is scale. If you don't get 100,000 and over 10 year period, then you're not thinking big enough. Because if you fragment, the biggest thing is that the government programs are fragmenting this, the aid and charity programs are fragmenting because they are cutting the cloth according to the money that you have. And you are dealing with multiple agencies with multiple conflicting interests. And I think you heard it from Mr. Kalra himself. The sector skill councils, the national occupation standards, there's a criticism that the sector skill councils are not getting formed fast enough. There are 30 associations in the construction industry. If we go with one, nobody's going to accept that. We've worked for a year and a half. The industry has got together and formed a confederation of construction industry. With all the players there, they're going to take ownership of this. Now, Mr. Ramodurai, who's the advisor of the thing, and Mr. Subai are going and meeting industry leaders in that sector, city by city, and saying, hey guys, you better sign up because we don't want to fragment it. We don't want you to go to some state government or some other place, place who comes and say, please do something with us and then you fragment the industry. And the whole quality insurance system, we are saying there's information asymmetry. You don't know what types of jobs available, where the jobs are there. So we did this skills gap analysis in the verticals. Now we're doing a spatial thing. Hopefully the two should add up. If you're not, we'll redo it to see what it is. So we'll know what is the skill gap in a district, let's say in Andhra, or a district in Orissa, although Mira does not uh, totally agree with the way we have done the Orissa study, but the two at the other ends of the yeah, other ends of the corridor can can actually discuss that. But yeah, so that's the learning. No, see, nobody had done skills gap studies before. 
you're bound to make mistakes. We accept it. We are, we are in a learning mode. We are ignorant. But at least we are trying to do something. So this is why it is not working. You know, how do you get sustainability? Because the, you know, the training delivery, the certification assessment, right, which leads to the job market is not connected to the industry. So industry was trying to do, oops, industry was trying to do in-house and captive training. And this is just not, you know, it is too costly. We are wasting money, we are fragmenting it. The governments, everybody was financing this model, but the disconnect was there. So we're actually trying to change it now. How do we get industry to lead and the entrepreneurs to lead? This is a model that is working in five sectors. Chartered accountants, company secretaries, cost and work accountants, marine engineers, there are no university which gives you a degree. It's all, you can't get those degrees. But when it comes to this, because the system was there, we are not willing to change. So we are trying to change the system. We actually take maximum of three months to approve a project. The fastest we've done it in 35 days. One project which is, which is submitted to us in October 2009 is still pending because it's a 100% grant project. They're not even willing to con consider taking a 0% loan for 50% of the money. We don't want to do that. We want to convert the mindset. And I can tell you that we are having another meeting with them on the 12th of March, and hopefully we'll reconvert them. But that's what we're doing. We're being patient. We do external due diligence. We have a very stringent monitoring process, which is not intrusion, which is there to help you. So if you know you're not doing well, how do we help you to go forward? And we do a lot of hand-holding that is there connecting you with different people. There are various touch points. I don't think that's, the, uh, that's what I want to talk about. Yes? So, you know, I didn't know what he was presenting. I just said, there are a lot of models of social entrepreneurship models. <coughs> the problem with social entrepreneurship models is that they can't scale, right? Uh, how can we actually take each one to scale. What interventions could be done? You know, there was this question I think you had raised about livelihoods, right, in the morning. You know, um, um, it's amazing. A self-help group cannot get bank financing for the first six months of its existence. Who will finance them? So we are telling industry, if you can do the self-help groups for the crafts thing, we will give you the bridge finance, right? You agree to pay a differential interest rate. Right? So we'll at least give you the access of finance. Similarly, if we can promote some NBFCs in the financing, in the, in the vocational financing model who can lend at close to bank rates, we'll be happy to do that. So this is what we are trying to actually do to connect to industry and to take different things to scale. Three challenges, quality, cost, and quantity. There are many people in this area we actually want to just enlarge the number, you know. The message to industry is that our cost of training is lower than yours and we can even do it better. You can't go out and source people. If they, that's the bottom line. If you do these two things, you bring it down to 1x, it's a win-win for everybody. The other thing is that if everybody doesn't have a stake in it, it's not going to succeed. Because if the government is giving you free money, they're suspicious of you. The, the, the trainee, if he doesn't give you money, he's got nothing at stake. If the employer doesn't pay, if the government is giving you money, the trainee is not paying, the employer will say, why do I need to pay? Then his expectations go down. So you need to move this group, enlarge it here. And there's no one model. You heard three in the morning or four in the morning. You've heard one now. That's what all entrepreneurship is about, no? 52 projects, 10 sector skill councils, 42 projects. There's not a single model that has been replicated. It's there. That's what all entrepreneurship is about. It's bad for management schools because they can't create a template and a success factor, but that's the way it is going forward. That's it. Thank you very much.